Okay, so uh, it's time for us to start the last session before lunch. Uh, and of course, I'll just be handing over to Thank you. David. Thank you. Great. Well, there's going to be a sudden grinding of gears here where we <clears throat> move from the warm and humanistic to the cold, heartless world of <laughs> numbers. <clears throat> Just to give you a very quick overview, I'll talk a bit about backgrounds to doing large-scale survey research, <clears throat> focus on its strengths and limitations. There will be actually a lot more limitations than strengths. Um, I'll offer some reflections on all that and then give you some examples from the major international surveys that we work with. And then finally, uh, just to give you some actual uh, empirical examples of what one can do. Um, I'll use the Baylor Religion Survey to uh, review images of God. So what are we trying to do when we do large-scale surveys? Well, here our purposes in general with these studies is sociological rather than psychological. That is, we're interested in uh, issues of social relationships and change rather than uh, explaining things at an individual level. Uh, clearly measuring through univariate statistics uh, prevalence of certain key characteristics uh, is a starting point. But overall, the emphasis is on the macro level the societal level as opposed to the micro or individual level. Um, so in terms of religion, it's completely conventional for uh, big general social surveys to ask about affiliation. Uh, that's tended to be done just in the battery of sociodemographic uh, items that are uh, always used. Um, uh, but also attendance at worship services is a fairly common one, you see. Belief is much less usual as a general social survey item, uh, partly because it seems rather personal, subjective. Um, it's something that seems harder to get at uh, and, um, and also perhaps uh, in the eyes of uh, many traditional researchers, less consequential. But um, it, certainly we can try to look at supernatural worldviews via social surveys. Uh, when we do, I think that there are at least four things, four S's uh, that we need to attend to. One is the substance or contents of those beliefs. Uh, <clears throat> another is the strength uh, or intensity of the beliefs. Uh, there's the stability versus volatility of them, and then the salience or how important they, they are. So I initially started actually with three eyes being image as an image of God, uh, intensity and importance. Uh, but then I thought that the S's were better and moreover they permitted the inclusion of stability, uh, which is nice. So. Uh, these are the things that we, I think, would potentially be interested in. Now, any given item uh, would typically be tapping probably only one or at most two of these. And we'll, as we look at or think about uh, survey items, maybe come back and, and reflect on which of these are covered more or less well in surveys. So what kinds of things might sociologists of religion or uh, general sociologists be interested in when it comes to uh, belief? Well, it just these are fairly uh, haphazardly chosen examples. We might be interested in uh, the growth or non-growth of alternative spirituality, uh, the persistence of belief or otherwise of people who say they have no religion, um, what it is that Christians actually believe in by way of uh, God and uh, Christian doctrine. Uh, gender differences in religiosity uh, is a, a popular topic. And then the beliefs of young European Muslims, uh, who are, of course, uh, a, a very important religious group in uh, our society. Uh, quantification can help 
in uh, thinking about both direct, uh, sorry, dependent and independent variables. So uh, we can look at who believes what and perhaps to some extent how much by various other demographic characteristics. And we can see how far religion uh, is associated with and perhaps has some causal influence on other things. And uh, the range is as wide as your imagination will allow, but certainly extends from uh, politics through to employment. Uh, quantification that is using these sorts of survey methods, I think is often uh, the best, perhaps sometimes the only way of testing big theories uh, about the causes and consequences of belief, for example. Uh, it's certainly natural uh, if we want to look at trends, and so I'm especially interested in religious change, uh, and that's why I'm particularly interested in using these numbers. We can ha look at recurrent uh, cross-sectional surveys that give us what we hope are comparable statistics uh, for year after year, decade after decade. And of course, if we're making international comparisons, then it helps to have some sort of common yardstick. Now, uh, we'll come on to discussions of the extent to which uh, surveys actually provide those things. Many of you are psych uh, psychologists of religion, and so it's appropriate to say a few words about the uh, distinctions here. I think the demarcation uh, lines aren't always especially uh, bright. They're fairly blurred, and some surveys indeed can uh, straddle that frontier. I, it's not for me to tell those of you who are psychologists what you should be interested in, and that I would probably uh, get into trouble if I uh, attempted to uh, to say what that is. But I think it's fair to say that the nature of psychology is that uh, what one is trying to explain are things at the individual level, and that's. Uh, a good thing to do. Um, sociologists are interested in that and think that it's important, uh, but their own particular field uh, relates to social factors. Uh, and uh, so that's the orientation that uh, sociologists or, or demographers might have. Well, uh, what are the strengths of uh, big surveys? It's, it, it's absolutely the case that uh, using simple survey items and then quantifying uh, the, the data uh, oversimplifies this very complex phenomenon of religion. There's no debate about that. But uh, on the flip side of that, they do force us to be very clear about what it is that we're doing uh, when we measure something and then study it. And uh, contrary to popular belief, quantitative social scientists are extremely aware of the frailty uh, of the uh, concepts uh, that are being used and, and the measures uh, that relate to them. Well, random or probability sampling uh, gives us some hope of coming up with uh, estimates about the prevalence of certain characteristics in a population. And uh, crucially, it allows you to calculate a confidence interval or a margin of error uh, based on probability theory and, and numbers and so on. So it, it's not that there's any guarantee that random samples produce uh, quotes representative uh, sample. I mean, the, the sample may or may not be representative. You can have what by good luck is a representative sample uh, drawn through totally non-random means and through random sampling you can come up with a sample that uh, is completely unrepresentative. The advantage of random or probability sampling is that you can actually calculate the probability that you are within a certain range of the truth. Now, there are, again, more caveats to add, but that's the basic rationale. 
Uh, the figures that one comes up with, particularly uh, the descriptive statistics, I think are very difficult to obtain by any other means. So uh, there's, to my mind, no issue that this is the way one has to go if you're trying to come up with uh, figures on prevalence, for example. All right, now into the limitations. And I've got at least three slides worth of imita limitations. So uh, let it not be said that quantitative social scientists are not self-critical. Uh, first of all, it's a very expensive business. Uh, if you're doing random sampling, by which I mean you're not going out with a clipboard on the street and grabbing people who pass by on the corner and you, know, you might be getting the right proportion of people uh, in different age groups and genders and so on. That's quota sampling, it's not random sampling. That's cheap. Doing proper random sampling is very expensive because you're basically taking a big hat with 50 million names in it or 10 million addresses or whatever and you're pulling uh, addresses or names out of that hat and then you're going and finding that person and you keep going back and pestering them until they answer. Uh, and uh, that, of course, it means that you're going back and back again and you're probably having to drive to some uh, remote part of uh, the country um, where it takes you an hour to get there and interviewers uh, get very unhappy about the whole process, but anyway, that's what's involved, and if you're doing a proper probability sample, and then spending an hour sitting at the kitchen table asking them questions, uh, it's clearly a very labor-intensive business. Now, there are different ways of doing it. It doesn't have to be face-to-face, -face, though that's seen as being at least classically sort of the gold standard. Uh, you can send people questionnaires in the post. You can ring them on the phone. Uh, these days, you can use the web uh, and do online surveys. Uh, all of those things tend to be associated with so-called mode effects, that is the Sort of advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of those that may be reflected in the responses that you get. Uh, there are also house effects, that is different survey data collection agencies uh, use somewhat different methods and of course different people and uh, those can produce uh, uh, some different results. Uh, the effects from interviewers, um, it may make a difference whether the uh, interviewer is the same gender, uh, the same ethnicity, um, has a friendly personality or a cool personality, and so on. Um, one of the difficulties for these purposes, looking at supernatural beliefs, uh, and in thinking of this dialogue between psychologists and sociologists, is that long batteries of the kind that were classically devised by psychologists of religion I really are very difficult to put in social surveys because they take so much time and time is money and as I said this is an expensive business and also in general social surveys you're often wanting to cover a whole variety of different topics so you're not so focused on one thing that you can spend five minutes talking about the image of God for example. I, Critical limitation, uh, and this is a growing problem, is non-response. So in the old days, uh, people were actually pleased when somebody rang them up and wanted to ask them questions. Now we absolutely hate it, so we cut people off mercilessly. Uh, we don't want to talk to anybody, we're surveyed out. Uh, and so it's very hard to get anyone's attention for the kind of time needed to go through a questionnaire of the length of, for example, the General Social Survey or the British Social Attitude Survey or the European Values Study or anything like that where you really do need an hour of someone's time. And yes, you'll give them uh, an Amazon voucher or a shopping voucher for 10 pounds, maybe even 20 pounds, but you know, still, frankly, it's an imposition and uh, lots of people don't want to do it. And then the question is, well, is that going to skew your sample? Now, there's, of course, been a huge amount of work on this, and I think the question is, it depends. But the problem is that often we don't know. Uh, so if non-respondents 
and respondents are different in relevant ways, that is relevant to whatever the issue is that you want to study, then this can be a truly serious problem. So if it were to be the case that, let's say, religious people were always open-hearted, generous, uh, wanting to help out the poor interviewer and were much more likely uh, to agree to do the study than hard-hearted atheists who would just tell people to go away, uh, of course that would skew the results. I, I think we have at least a certain amount of evidence that that tends not to be the case, but there are particularly hard to reach populations that we certainly do miss. And anyway, I just want to emphasize that as being an issue. Uh, other limitations, well, uh, almost by their nature, uh, these surveys involved closed questions. That is to say, there is a fixed list of responses on offer uh, and people can't just go off and tell you whatever they think, um, they have to tick a particular box. In rare instances, they can fill in uh, something in free text and then that has to be coded. Uh, and because that too is an expensive business, you try to keep those uh, as, uh, few, to be as few as possible. One thing that I think is a big problem, and this is to some extent a problem with any kind of research, uh, but perhaps particularly with survey research, is that they can elicit what the uh, political scientist Phil Converse called non-attitudes. That is to say, people are very willing to, once they're getting into the groove, to answer questions. They will answer questions on anything and will make up an opinion if they don't have one. Uh, or e even if they might think they have an opinion, uh, maybe it's something they never really thought much about, but they will want to give you an answer. People are generally somewhat reluctant to say, I have no knowledge whatsoever that would permit me to answer this question. I'm sorry. Um, so it, it's very difficult to know how well founded uh, the, the answers you get are. There's of course the issue of social desirability. Um, religion is not by any means the most sensitive thing that is asked about in social surveys, but it's towards the sensitive end of the scale. Uh, there are lots of translation problems, so if you're doing an international study and you're hoping to ask a question that is basically going to be understood in the same way in England, France, Germany, the Czech Republic, Poland, and so on, uh, it can be very difficult often, um, and we can come on to some, to some examples of that. And then finally, just in this list, I think cross-cultural measurement of supernatural belief is especially problematic um, because items tend to be very closely related to a particular religious tradition or a particular cultural background. And um, it's not, not at all easy to devise a set of questions which of course, you know, we th think of being done in the Western world uh, from a Christian heritage perspective and think that we can just take them to East Asia and uh, get sensible responses. Uh, so uh, just to be more specific about some of those issues, uh, it, if there are particular ideas like the Trinity or reincarnation uh, that aren't well understood, uh, you then may not know how to interpret the answers because the respondents didn't know how to interpret the question. It, it's very difficult to ask about or find out about unconventional supernatural beliefs because the list of things that you can believe in is just so long. Um, there have been multiple attempts to try to devise batteries of items on alternative spirituality and they generally founder on the sheer range uh, and vagueness uh, of the area. And then of course what's viewed as conventional or unconventional is in any case specific to the culture and the religious tradition. 
Uh, just to uh, <laughs> they suggest that there are some ways of dealing with sensitive topics, and you don't always have to make people say, I am an atheist. Uh, you know, one thing that's often done in face-to-face -face interviewing is to give people so-called show cards. So you might be reading out the responses, but you can also give people a card with the responses printed on them, and they can just give you the answer as A, B, C, or D. Now, of course, it's clear that the interviewer will know that A is for atheist, for example, uh, but still, it, it's at least a step in the direction of not having to say it. Something that's done increasingly, particularly on really sensitive topics, uh, you know, sexual behavior, for example, uh, respondents will just be given the tablet and then also some assurances that the answers they uh, choose on the tablet will be sent off to some impersonal computer and it's all anonymous and so on. Now, I don't claim that these are perfect solutions. You know, they may or may not believe any of the assurances about confidentiality, but there are at least some things that can be done. All right. Um, I, it's worth saying, and I think this isn't, this will be understood by you, but it's often not understood by students. So you start to talk about surveys and they think, oh gosh, this sounds like a big job. You know, I have to design a questionnaire and then figure out how I give it to you. Well, the large majority of survey researchers like me are just doing secondary analysis of existing data sets. So although I have actually been involved, for example, on the European Values Study uh, in questionnaire design and organizing the logistics and so on, uh, that is not my preferred uh, modus operandi at all. I would far rather go to a data archive, find the existing data, and then analyze it. And so that's generally, in fact, what quantitative sociologists are, are doing. Uh, of course, that's very limiting because it means that we're restricted to using whatever data happen to be available. So I'm telling you not so much what quantitative social, sociologists do because they're not in general going out organizing surveys, uh, but what needs to be done in order for the people like me to do the work that, that I do. I'm just on a slightly different topic, panel studies or if you like longitudinal studies using uh, uh, the same people uh, can be, should be very useful for looking at religious change within individuals. Uh, in practice, um, it can be more difficult. I was discussing with uh, John yesterday how question wording often changes over time or is changed. Uh, and of course, these studies are extraordinarily expensive uh, and by definition, they go on for years. So if you're hoping to see what changes occur between age 12 and 25, you'll be waiting 13 years to find out. And uh, that's a long time in anyone's money. Well, the upshot of all this is what I've promoted over the year as Vos's law, which is that a quarter of responses to any question on religion are unreliable. And that for a number of reasons, but principally because they're so sensitive to the context in which questions are asked, even to the design of the survey and the, uh, the other topics just immediately before and after. Uh, the wording of the question, the range of response options, and so on. Well, the very surprising, or what could be seen as surprising things that come up when you do survey research. So you get very high levels of apparent belief in for example, reincarnation, uh, ghosts, um, uh, clairvoyance, um, very popular one. And I, I don't think that people are insincere when they say that in some sense they believe in them. I think very often they haven't really reflected on them. Uh, if you probe, and of course this is easier if you have a, a mixed uh, 
approach or a qualitative supplement uh, and try to find out what it is that they think about life after death, you often find that they haven't really thought about it and they don't want to say that there couldn't be one, but likewise, um, they don't really know what they think because they don't seem to have thought about it very much. Uh, and whether they'll believe the same thing tomorrow, I think is an open question. Uh, so very often, the substance is unclear, the strength or intensity of the belief seems to be very weak, the salience is very low, it doesn't seem to be important to them, and the stability is, is low. So um, it, it, it's critical, I think, for all of us to think not just about do people believe yes, no, or even do they believe, well, definitely, probably, probably not, definitely not, but um, how much difference does it make? Uh, what doubts are they willing to entertain? And uh, will they believe the same thing next week? And that's especially a, pro a problem, I think, with alternative spirituality. Okay, let me get on to uh, some actual survey items. Now, these are taken from the International Social Survey Program modules on religion. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the ISSP or have used it, but it's a very important international survey. Um, it, it, it basically consists of modules that are either run as standalone studies in a whole variety of countries or uh, it will be attached to the vehicle of an existing major survey, like, for example, the General Social Survey in the United States, um, the British Social Attitude Survey in Britain, uh, the Albus uh, study in Germany, um, and uh, in those cases, it will be just a set of supplementary items attached to those big national surveys. Anyway, the ISSP is an international uh, organization, they come up with these modules on a whole range of different topics, work, gender, the environment, you name it. There have been four religion uh, modules now, 1991, 98, 2008, 2018. So we're basically on a kind of 10-year cycle at the moment with the religion module. And I'll just show you the key questions that are included in the ISSP religion module on supernaturalism. So first of all, the question on belief in God. This is probably the single best known survey data uh, question on belief in God. And I think it's a pretty good one overall. There's six options, so that's already better than, a lot better than yes, no. Uh, and it's even better than having just three or four options. So you have explicitly an atheist an agnostic, uh, well, yes, believe with, but with some doubts and believe no doubts at all. And then in the middle, I think the, the two intermediate ones are a bit more problematic. There's the, I don't believe in a personal God, but I do believe in a higher power of some kind. So there you're getting away from the strength of belief into um, the, the type of belief. So that, I think the higher power clearly has to do with the image of God, it's to do with the substance of the belief, and it is, in a sense, I think, on a different dimension to uh, the other items or the other response options. And then I find myself believing in God some of the time, not at others. That seems to be a sort of woollier response that's a bit weaker than the next one. While I have doubts, I feel I do believe in, in God. Anyway, so I have some doubts about the question itself, but overall, I think this is by far and away the best social survey question that is used, and it's used not just in the ISSP, but it's been adopted in, in other studies. Um, but I'd be interested in your reflections on it. Um, there's a question that relates to stability. So you can say whether you uh, did or didn't believe in God in the past compared to now. There are also questions about different kinds of uh, supernatural things, life after death, heaven, hell, miracles, reincarnation, nirvana, 
supernatural powers of deceased ancestors. And here it's a, essentially a four item Likert scale from yes, definitely, through to no, definitely not, but with um, uh, vague uh, possibilities in, in the, the middle. And I think it's interesting, for example, that while belief in life after death has indeed held up very well, uh, in the younger generations, it's clear that it's the probabilities that are winning out over the definitelys. So the, the definitelys are declining, but the probab probabilities are, are going up. And I think there are interesting things to say about that. Um, there's a, a set of items here that I think are surprisingly useful. So there's another attempt at the personal God uh, question, or at least sort of image of God, um, question about fate, about the meaningfulness of life in relation to God's existence. And it's extraordinary the range of national variation you get on that one, life is meaningful only because God exists. The uh, levels cross-nationally go from the single digits up until through the 95 plus percent. So there are countries in the world where just about everybody says, yep, absolutely, that's right. And <clears throat> other countries where people say, well, no, that's silly. Um, all right, so uh, those are just a sort of classic Likert scale, five points from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And then there's this attempt to get at uh, being spiritual or religious or some combination, but with explicit reference to the sacred or the supernatural, which is why I've included it here. And then these are optional items, so they're not routinely included by many countries. The idea of the ISSP module is that if it's adopted in a particular country, it is used in its entirety in the way that it's presented, uh, so in the same way, uh, cross-nationally. But there are certain optional items <clears throat> that uh, the, the national organizers uh, may or may not use. And so these are some of them. And obviously, they're an attempt to tap alternative spirituality um, in the, the context where that was thought to be significant. There are a couple of questions that are used on the ISSP or indeed elsewhere that I think are potentially proxies for belief, uh, even though they don't explicitly refer to the supernatural. Uh, one is whether you describe yourself as extremely religious, not so religious, not religious, and so on. Uh, another is that we, you agree or disagree that we put too much trust in science and not enough in religious faith. And then sometimes people are asked how important God or religion is in life. Now, the, I won't go through uh, the value studies uh, in the same detail, uh, but just briefly to say uh, the other big international uh, social survey program uh, is the European Values Study, which then was extended uh, into the World Values Survey. These are actually separate organizations, though they're cooperating now uh, in Europe. I think in general, their questions, to my mind, are not as good as the ISSP ones. And I say that as somebody who has actually had responsibility for the EVS questionnaire. But uh, part of the problem with these for current surveys is that you inherit the old and then you feel a kind of obligation to keep the old measures so you can look at change. Uh, but this is the one about belief in God. So the first option is that there is a personal God. Now this is both very difficult, I think, for people to understand even in our societies and it's extremely difficult to translate into other languages uh, in a way that makes sense. So I, I think it's it, not a great item, but anyway, that's what we inherited. I'm conscious the time is getting on, so let me just quickly give you uh, 
some actual results just because they're sort of fun. Um, and this is something that psychologists of religion, I believe, think about a lot, which is images of God. And sociologists of religion hardly ever study. Uh, one exception being Paul Froese and Chris Bader, who a decade ago uh, wrote a book called America's Four Gods, which I do recommend. I think it's, it's very good. And uh, to give the late Andrew Greeley uh, credit, he was very interested in uh, images of God and indeed uh, developed and funded use of a battery of items uh, on images of God in the ISSP. And they were optional items for many years. I don't think, to, to my mind, they were very good items. They were <clears throat> um, as, uh, extremes uh, where you were asked to say where along the scale you thought God fell between being a father and a mother, a judge and a friend, and there were a couple others like that, king and something, um, and I found them mystifying. But anyway, uh, to his credit, Andrew Greeley was pushing us to, do, to learn more about it. Right, so <clears throat> the Baylor religion study or survey uh, includes lots of questions about God. It's great in that respect. <clears throat> I mean, in some ways, it looks more like a, a psychology questionnaire than a sociology questionnaire. Um, but I've picked out just four of the items that I was particularly interested in. So do you think, and I should say that after the first wave, they excluded atheists. So they decided it didn't make sense to ask atheists what they thought God was like. Um, uh, but everyone else, and there, not, there weren't very many in the United States anyway. Um, so most people were answering uh, this question uh, having said they thought there probably was some kind of God. Uh, do you think that God is concerned about the well-being of the world, concerned about my personal well-being, and then directly involved in the world, in world affairs and directly involved in my affairs? And quickly, do you have any guesses? So everybody got all four of these, uh, which ones were the most popular, which ones would most people strongly agree with, and which one would fewest people strongly agree with? Is this America in general? This is just, yeah, America, but it's a cross-section of the American population. Individual ones? Individuals. Individuals, yeah, yeah. America is broken. Oh, I see, yes. No, this is red and blue, so they're, they're all in it together. Silver. Yeah, silver, <laughs> right. Okay, well, I, I will tell you, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's easier to say God is concerned about the world than that God is directly involved in the world, right? So, so the ones that got the most votes were concerned about the well-being of the world and concerned with my personal well-being. And of those two, it was concerned about the world that comes out on top. So, I mean, if you believe in God and you think that God has any interest whatsoever in his creation, then presumably you think that God is concerned about the world. So that's sort of a no-brainer, I think. And then most people also thought, well, yeah, if there's a God, then God is also concerned about me, so that's fine. Okay, so then it gets interesting because we get on to whether God is directly involved. And you would think, well, wouldn't it just follow the same order? God is directly involved in worldly affairs and then bottom of the pile is directly involved in my affairs. No, God is directly involved in my affairs and bottom comes God is directly involved in worldly affairs, which I suppose makes sense actually. So we're not gonna blame God for what's going on in Ukraine because that would just be not nice. Uh, and, and we want God to be involved in our affairs because otherwise, why would we do things like pray? So strong agreements there goes in the order shown. Um, so you have the personal items sort of sandwiched in the middle between the concern for the well-being of the world and directly involved in worldly affairs at the bottom. All right, um, I, I, there are things one can say about prayer. Um, I mentioned that atheists were excluded. 
Let me just show you something that is maybe sort of intriguing, uh, which is strong agreement that God is directly involved in world affairs over time. So early years on the left starts in 2005, uh, most recent survey was in 2021 on the right. Uh, and two lines here, the blue one is evangelical and black Protestants, and the orange is mainline Protestants and Catholics. So those uh, mainline Protestants and Catholics were pretty similar. Uh, and there's decline uh, in all of those. So everybody, even religious uh, or religiously affiliated people, uh, are less likely now than they were even 16 or 17 years ago uh, to say that God is directly involved in, in world affairs. And I, I did actually create a scale measure. Um, uh, you can do this either using classical methods or I used a rush model. Uh, and I'll just sort of race through these, um, you get basically the same kind of story on that. And uh, if you want to look at who tends to believe in an engaged God, uh, well, it's more likely to be women, it's more likely to be black people, uh, married and widowed people, having children in rural areas in the American South, being less educated and earlier in time rather than later in time. Um, so with that, I will just leave you with this excerpt from the novel Gilead, not to do with The Handmaid's Tale. This is by uh, Marilyn Robinson. It's actually one of Obama's favorite books. Uh, and it's just kind of amusing statements about who believes or disbelieves. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to hearing your comments. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Um, I often like want to give presentations where I kind of mention the prevalence rates of whatever religiosity variable, say in the UK, mm. and then I look at the census, and then I look at the BSA, and the numbers don't correspond, mm -hmm. and I don't really know how to, right, because I'm not a sociologist, so I don't really know how to make a decision, mm. right, on the basis of the kind of pros and cons of the mm -hmm. census versus the BSA. Like, what are the factors that you think about when you're trying to figure out, I mean, it, like, um, pre presumably when you give talks, you do the same thing, having to pick, you know, one study maybe versus another, like what are your thoughts about how, how to pick a number? Well, so there we're talking about affiliation or self-identification. Um, and with, it, 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 there are all sorts of reasons, I think, for that contrast specifically between the census and the, the BSA. And in fact, there's a whole article that I've written. You can read about this. But oh, okay. anyway, um, one key difference is that the census question, I think, is leading. The wording is, what is your religion? And that tends to imply that you have one. The answers are then big world religions like Christian, Muslim, so on. And that tends to be helpful to people who say, oh yeah, well, my heritage is Christian. Whereas if you say Church of England, Catholic, Methodist, people say, oh yeah, well, I know I'm not really one of those. So that, I think, makes a very significant difference. And you know, it might seem slight or superficial, but actually it's fairly deep. Um, the religion question in the first round in 2001 immediately followed the one on ethnicity and looked very much like a follow-up question on ethnicity. And indeed, if you read the census white paper, it was in a sense conceived as a follow-up question on ethnicity. It was specifically because <clears throat> um, we didn't know very much about the South Asian population. There are all of these South Asians and were they Hindus, were they Muslim, what were they? And we can kind of guess the Pakistanis are Muslim, but the Indians could be anything. So anyway, um, I think lots of people responded to it in that sort of way. They first got the question saying, are you white, black, or brown? And then they got the question, what kind of thing are you? And they would say, I am a white Christian person. So um, that's an extremely condensed version, but that gives you some of the sense of how context and wording 
and the answer options can play into all this. Whereas the British Social Attitudes question is, do you regard yourself as belonging to religion or religious group? So the sense of belonging arguably pushes in the other direction because now people are thinking, well, no, I don't really belong. Uh, and then the answer options are, you know, Church of England, Catholic and so on. And that sort of puts the nail in it. And you say, yeah, well, I, I'm really not a churchgoer. I'm not specifically affiliated with one of those things. So, no. But then the, the other factor is that the census is like a 97% response rate, right? And then the BSA right. presumably has a lower one. So how do you weigh up the... the yeah, but then on the other hand, the census form is often completed by one person on behalf of everybody in the household. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, but you know, you're right. All of these things end up having to be juggled and... I th would go back to Vos's law that a quarter of responses are <laughs> <laughs> unreliable. And, you know, I, it, it, I'm not arguing that the BSA is right and the census is wrong. I'm just saying they have to be interpreted and they have different meanings. And but when you give talks, which number do you use? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I would often use both. I mean, often I'm interested in showing change over time and the BSA is much better for that actually because it started in 83, whereas the census only asked about religion in 2001. There have been many more repetitions of the BSA and it's just you know, better for my purposes. Um, but of course, it's important to acknowledge that there's this other important source. Cool. I have a very related and somewhat selfish question. So say someone was doing research in a place like Mauritius where mm -hmm. a religious group identity and um, ethnic identity and like linguistic group are all the same thing. So yes. if you look at the census categories and what people will assume, they will say they are Hindu, which is mm. a religious group, mm. Tamil, which mm. is a linguistic group, mm. like Maharaji, which is a linguistic group, mm. um, Muslim, Chinese, or uh, Creole, which is like mm. black Christians, French people, and like mm. everyone else. So how, how do you structure questions to kind of tease that thing apart when people start conflating religious belief with ethnic group identity and it's really hard to kind of pull those ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess it depends what it is we're trying to do and, and get at. And I think I would want to distinguish belief from social identity. So there, you know, we're talking about a context where identity is very salient, um, but as you say, there's a very close correlation between ethnicity and religion, but the religious identification um, may clearly relate to belief, but it's still a sort of quasi-ethnic group in that sense. I mean, if you say that you're Hindu, it's just another way of identifying one of those big ethnic groups that you're in, in Mauritius, right? Yeah, so. so yeah, I mean, this is essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to pull out belief from something that gets tied to identity. So at right. some point, you need to be able to get them to say they're Hindu and that they don't really think they're Hindu. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, so I, th I think I, I would want to distinguish between the sort of socio-demographic, and I'm talking as a social surveyor here, not as a psychologist, obviously. I'd want to distinguish the the background variables where you're getting facts about their social location, and that's their age, gender, ethnicity, you know, what kind of community they belong to, if you like, and then whatever details you need about education, occupation, blah, blah, blah. From the religious side of things, where you're trying to probe what their worldviews are, and their worldview might be anything, notwithstanding the fact that you know they're Tamil and Hindu, for example. There's, um, yeah, I, I think that's, I, I, I mean, all I can say is that I don't think it's reasonable, and I'm sure you don't think it's reasonable to go from this religio eth or ethno-religious identity to a belief, because even if there's a high correlation, you still, that's what you might want to find out about. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Do you find that there's cohort 
or kind of different generation effects with these? Absolutely, ones? that's what all my research is about, actually. <laughs> um, so, yes, I think there's been sort of generational progression in uh, religious identification and practice and belief, um, and at least in the Western world and arguably in some other places, um, we're seeing the very gradual, it's a slow process, replacement of older, more religious generations in the population by younger, less religious ones. And that's how secularization happens at a kind of uh, proximate level. It's, it's those cohort effects that are driving the process of religious decline. Now, I think in some times and places, uh, with Ireland being a wonderful example, looking at Q-Turp and out the bottom, uh, but perhaps with the United States being another example and Quebec possibly being uh, yet another case, you can have important period effects where um, you see everybody um, defecting from religion over time. And actually, where's Russell? The New Zealand census is absolutely fascinating. In fact, I <clears throat> should have thought to show the, uh, the graphs. Um, you have very strong cohort effects. So using the New Zealand census, which is wonderful, and they've asked about religion for a long time, you <clears throat> can actually break people down into five-year birth cohorts going back to 1895, and none of the lines overlap. Every single five-year birth cohort over the whole time they've <clears throat> asked about religion is slightly lower than the one before. So amazingly, clear cohort effects, but also downward sloping lines showing that census by census, everyone in each generation is less likely to identify with religion uh, or a religion than in the uh, previous census. So, so you get both of those. And I think the latest Australian census or the last couple of censuses have shown a similar period type decline. Just to follow up, do you know what's being replaced for some of these people that are saying they're not religious? So you mean, what are they? What is the substance of their non Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you've got the data on that, but. Well, I be, you know, the, there are people who are very interested in studying this, and there are research <coughs> programs now going on on the substance of non-religion, uh, non in fact. There's something called the Non-Religion and Secularity Association uh, that's having a conference in Canada in the middle of next year. I think it's, if I'm remembering correctly, it's June, but I might be wrong. Anyway, the theme of that conference is something like the substance of no religion, and um, people will be discussing what it is that comes along when you're no longer religious. Mm. All right. I, yeah. I think there's going to be lots more questions over lunchtime, but we don't want to 